Grand Touring Motorsports started as a social group of car enthusiasts, but we've expanded into all sorts of motorsports disciplines, and we want to share our stories with you. Years of racing, wrenching, and motorsports experience brings together a top-notch collection of knowledge and information through our podcast, Break Fix. A little over 50 years ago, a few local car clubs joined together with the vision of building a better place to race in the Northeast. Since then, the Eastern Motorsports Racing Association, better known as EMRA, has grown to become one of the premier sanctioning bodies on the East Coast. EMRA's wheel-to-wheel racing series is designed to deliver close, competitive racing for cars of all makes and models, and their goal is to provide top competition without sacrificing any of the enjoyment. EMRA members race hard and always have fun. That's right, Brad. And with us tonight is Corey Canzone, Chairman and Chief Instructor of EMRA, along with John Katz, the CIO, CTO, and Marketing for EMRA, to tell us all about their new and improved program. So welcome to the show, John and Corey. Hey, thank you very much. Happy to be here. All right, guys, like any good story, there's always an origin. And we're talking about a 50-plus-year-old story here. So tell us about the who, what, when, and where, and explain the history of EMRA and where you guys came from. Well, I guess it was around the mid-60s. There was a bunch of guys who were sort of street racing around New York and Long Island. They all belonged to different car clubs. Back then, depending on the kind of car you had, you know, was the club you belonged to. So there was a bunch of different clubs, like all the British cars, you know, the little roadsters, and they were always trying to race the Corvettes and stuff. So the clubs, they would organize sort of street racing. They kept getting in trouble, and they decided, well, listen, why don't we uh, fight this out on the track? That's a good um, way to do it. it. Yeah, you know, the the legal way. (laughs) (laughs) So they joined together. They created a club called EMRA. The club consisted of the seven different car clubs, and they would hold monthly meetings to organize it, to figure out the rules, and to create a system that they could go in and race their cars legally. And some of my research, you know, kind of looking back over the history of EMRA, it seems like they were one of the first racing organizations to really kind of splinter off of SCCA, which is the oldest sports car club in the United States. You guys are very closely tied in terms of being like, let's say second place there for the oldest car club or racing club in the U.S. And I was looking over it to your point, the British Car Owners Association, the Long Island Corvette Owners Association, Long Island Sports Car, South Shore Sports Car and Beer Drinking Society. I was like, there's some really <laughs> Really kind of interesting clubs that make up the original yeah, core of Emory. I want to hear more about the South Shore Sports Car and Beer Drinking Society. Still that sounds strong. like it's right up my alley. <laughs> That's actually the shirt that I have on right now because I have been a member of that club since I started with Emra, dating myself back in the mid-90s. The clubs were a big part, and there were volunteers. COA, the Long Island Corvette Owners Association, is still around today, and they're still a part of us. A lot of the other clubs, the membership sort of fell away because you had Liverpool. There's not really a lot of those cars that are easy to come by anymore. And Boscoa and and the others. The membership kind of dwindled as, you know, the members got older. And um, the South Shore Sports Car and Beer Drinkers Society was open to any car, the same as Scuderia X. Uh, the other clubs, they they kind of catered toward a specific model or a specific make. We tried to keep that going as long as we could. We still have a representative, and now where the board of directors used to be, few of the main players that needed to be like the chairman and the race director, and then you have a secretary and treasurer and that kind of thing, then you had a representative from each of the seven clubs. And so now we have a a representative who covers most of the clubs. And then we have FRCCA as well and LICOA that still join our meetings, you know, because they have a vested interest in what's happening with the club and their members, they want to have a place to be able to take their cars out to drive on the track or race or compete in time trials 
how, however they want to do it. So for those that don't know, the FRCCA is formula racing, mostly open wheel cars, et cetera. And it's kind of funny because we've had a few GTMers that have joined our ranks that have come from EMRA. And so there's, you know, obviously it's a small community and there's always cross pollination and things like that. You know, we've heard of EMRA for a long while, but then when we came on the scene in the, you know, 2018 season, let's call it that, we noticed that EMRA was embracing other groups and seeming to kind of continue to foster that idea of adopting smaller clubs. Because when we got there, you guys had the 86 group, which was the BRZ FRS guys. They had their own class. They were competing against each other in the same way that this started 50 years ago. So, you know, that's actually really cool. And it's very rare to see that anymore because most organizations want you to bend to whatever they got, right? If it's a Corvette club, you got to drive a Corvette or a Porsche club, you got to drive a Porsche. SCCA and NASA, obviously they're so big that it doesn't matter what you drive. They figured out how to class everything and make it work, sort of. I'm going to put an asterisk around that. (laughs) But but yeah, I think it's really cool because this is very unique and I don't want to call it an old school mentality, but it's very inviting to bring in these smaller groups that are trying to find their way. And Emmer is a great home for them to either launch their program or I hate to say, get absorbed into the greater Emra itself. Yeah. I was going to add also, and it's the same philosophy with trying to bring on new drivers. So what we try to do is create a, I don't want to say safe place, but kind of a safe place for new drivers that have never been out on track before. Come take our student program, get involved, you know, the same way that we take on smaller clubs that want to come and may not be able to rent a track, come join with us and we can all, you know, do this for the greater good. Since you're, you were made up or you, you, you started from splintering from many, or you've got a group of many different clubs, what if for the new, I guess, leaders of some of the smaller clubs that might be listening to this today, what do they need to do if they want to get involved with EMRA, like the 86 group and, and you know, and have their own class or whatever? Like, what do they have to do? EMRA.org slash contact. <laughs> reach out. We're reach out. We're always speaking with different clubs, and always speaking with people who want to join forces and, and come run with us. You know, we are always ever evolving and, and growing and morphing. And again, we're just looking to push this to the next season and, and get more people involved and you know, just get more people out there to join the Emmer family. The cost of renting tracks is growing exponentially year yeah. on year. And it's, I understand it. I understand that they are running a business. That's what they have to do. But it gets more difficult for smaller clubs to come up with six digits for a three-day weekend somewhere. This has been happening to other clubs as well. And because the community is small, we get to talk to a lot of different people about where they're running and people who want to step up from autocross to come and experience what a track event is going to feel like. It's easy to say that uh, we'll just take anybody because there's so many people that are, that are out there that don't know what to do or how to begin. And so these small clubs, you have to integrate correctly. It can't just be anyone. You know, on-track etiquette and safety, of course, that's always the the most important things. We'll talk about that later with, with instructing and what we do with students and classroom and all sort of stuff like that. But the groups also have to fit. You can only run a certain number of cars on track at a certain time. What is your end goal? Are you looking to compete or are you just looking to get some experience to start to see if that's something that you want to continue or or aim towards? Speaking about Emra, what are some of the key differentiators between you all and some of the other clubs that still exist today? The SCCAs, the NASAs, the PCAs. You know, as a, as a participant or a driver or even a, a small club, of, uh, I guess, leader, why would I want to choose Emerald? What's your elevator pitch? At the expense of sounding cheesy, we're, we're a big family. We really are. You know, I, we keep in touch with each other on track, off track, always looking to help each other. I had an aha moment. It was my second season out. So I started, I'm, I'm relatively new in the, in, in the motorsport industry, but I've been doing this about a little over three years now. The first day that I trailered my uh, car to Pocono by myself, no friends or anything, I get there, I go to unload, my car is stuck on the trailer. What am I going to do? I'm by myself. I don't have any tools. Like my lip was hanging over the trailer. I couldn't get the thing off. I'm about to pack up and go home. Everybody was like, stop. People were running over with tools. I mean, we had five guys in a matter of 10 minutes taking apart the trailer to get me off of the trailer to compete against them. Like, it's unbelievable the, you know, that that was my aha moment, like right there. I was like, wow, 
these people actually care. <laughs> like coming from a kid growing up drag racing, it's like everybody's like, hey, like I'm hiding this from you because I need to be a 10th faster. It's like, no, here it's like, we, we want to help you get a 10th faster. Why don't you try this in the next corner? Yeah, it's a family atmosphere. It really is. I could say another differentiator. We, we don't make you run PDE for three, four years before getting into time trial. If your instructor says that you're capable at this point, put a transponder on the car and start running against the clock and, and start competing with other people in your skill range. Yeah, let's do it. Let, let's get you starting to compete. You know, we basically, we give drivers the opportunity to grow and really with their comfort level on the track, just start competing. Besides that, we're a not-for-profit. So at the end of the day, we're not looking to pad our pockets. We're looking to break even at the end of the season just so we can push again for the next season and do it again. So we try to keep our pricing you know, as, as a dead break even. Breaking even for us is a win. That's what we look to do. I could say our style of time trial, you know, we align with global time attacks, time trial style where, you know, get out there, you have a few sessions to do it, but run fastest time of the day on one lap and post your time up. And we're not breaking this out into two separate days. We're not breaking you out into a, you know, a half track sprint and then averaging times and stuff. It's very similar to the global time attack style who we've aligned with. You know, what we're looking to be is the premier regional time attack organization to prep people to potentially compete on the national level. And that's really what we're going to do. You know, John touched on it before. The people that come, they realize the atmosphere. And it's nice because it is competitive. Rob and uh, Randy, who who helped John get his block-stuck Cadillac <laughs> off of his trailer, <laughs> You know, they, they get the car off the trailer and then they say, all right, now I'm going to go kick your ass, you know, but, yeah. but there, there is, there's that competitiveness is there, but at lunchtime where everybody's flipping burgers and I do, I think that's an important part of it because that's what really has kept me around and, and made me want to keep Emma around and to help out. I mean, we're all volunteers. We do it because we love it and we want other people to love it the way that we do. To John's point, I think it was a great segue talking about becoming the premier time trials organization. I think you guys have a massive foothold in that. I think there's a lot of other organizations that are trying to catch up in that respect. And I'm, I'm not going to name names, but some of them will do it in conjunction with their DE program. Some of them will do it in conjunction with their club racing, right? They need to fill the spots to pay the bills, as you say, but there's not this dedicated vision and direction and target of we want to be time trials. And for me, especially, I came from the autocross world, from the pro solar world, you know, grew up in that. And everybody makes fun of the tri trialers sometimes, especially the club racers, like, well, that's just qualifying. And I'm like, great. I'm going to qualify at the front. Where are you going to end up? Right. <laughs> so think about it that way. Time trials is awesome for that one respect, because sometimes the race is determined on where you started. And so it's really, really important. So it's Eastern Motorsport Racing Association. What is the footprint? Define Eastern, I should say. What are some of the tracks you guys run at? We have run yeah. at a lot of different. I was going to say, we have to tracks. break this up because we're in a rebuild year right now. Being a not-for-profit last year hurt us because, again, we run at basically zero because we want to break even. We don't want to make money. We want to make sure that we're giving back to the community, making sure that our pricing is in line with what we're paying. So the problem becomes when a year like COVID hits, our down payments are gone. So we're basically in a rebuild year right now. We aren't able to run the tracks this year that we used to run. So yeah, sorry, Corey, I interrupted you. There. No, it's all good. Started out very locally to the tri-state area. We ran Bridgehampton, Lime Rock. You know, we used to go to the old Briar, which is now New Hampshire, you know, and we go as far south as Summit Point. Summit Point is, you know, one of our favorite places to go. And we have a, a good group of guys who love the track and we end our season there. We've been to Watkins Glen. We've been to Beaver Run, which is now Pit Race, which that's uh, a little, it's a little far. It's, it's a little bit of a stretch. When we're going to do an event like that, we try to coordinate with another group or we'll reach out to some of the car clubs that are local out there and you know, just to get the word out. But we're excited about Palmer. We started Palmer three years ago, right before uh, the pandemic. And we had a great event there. We had great uh, weather and the turnout was nice. Then we had to cancel in 2020. You know, going back this year was tough, but we had a we had an amazing event there. 
we had a lot of new drivers showing up from autocrossing routes. But that actually gets us into a conversation about EMRA and the services that it offers. So when we joined with EMRA and came out during the 2018 season, it was still kind of this mixed bag of there was club racing, time trials, and DE all at the same time. So is that still the case or has it now shifted in 2021 as you guys are rebuilding? It has shifted a little bit. Our focus was always on the time attack. We like to have the club racing. That is a session and it's fun for everyone to watch. Our club racers are are very dedicated. I, I am one of them. But the global time attack is where the community is moving towards. And we've been noticing that. I mean, back the way it used to be, what Emra would do is we would have a weekend. It would be Saturday was time trials day and Sunday was race day. There started to be a shift as times changed and the cars sort of changed and people wanted to take their street cars and bring them to the track and go compete for a trophy. It's a little harder to police. Uh, I'm not going to lie about that because <laughs> your street car, you're changing it all the time. You're driving it every day. You're doing little things. And so every time you come to the track, your car is a little bit different. So how do you, how do you really keep tabs on that? You know, whereas like a race car or a, a dedicated track car will have a log book. So we've tried to adjust and uh, John hates it this way, but the way that time <laughs> trials used to happen, you would practice for the day. You would have your two or three sessions for the day. And then at the end of the day, you would line up, depending on the track, three or four cars that were on track at the same time to do two time laps. That was actually like really like qualifying. You would just go out there and lay, lay it down. You know, for your two laps, all your practice for the day, you could have ran three seconds faster earlier in the morning, but it doesn't matter. It was before transponders and transponders made it easy to track everything you were doing all day long. Mm -hmm. So we had volunteers with stopwatches. And so I, I thought it was fun. And, and I thought it really like it, it sort of defined the day. You know, you were aiming towards something. Which I don't like. <laughs> I'm with you on that. I'd rather. Yeah. Listen, I want consistency. You're, you're, <laughs> yeah. Consistency. You're learning throughout the day. You're getting potentially faster all day. You know, you, Corey, you mentioned. In Palmer, I could tell you again, I, I'm a very new driver. So for me, the beginning of Palmer to the end of the day at Palmer was night and day difference. I learned so much this season just from that like weekend at Palmer that I could tell you, yeah, I may have been, I was probably faster at the end of the day, but the, the track is getting greasy or something, you know, something goes wrong with the car. Like I, I'm all about like, hey, if you get out there at, at first session, nine in the morning and you just ran a killer lap, and you can't touch that for the rest of the day, that should be your killer lap. <laughs> like, and, that's and where I, I'm at. I hear you on that, because when I came to Emra to do time trials, I had already been trialing with SECA. And what was yep. funny is somebody from Emra, one of the veterans that was there, he said to me, and I was kind of like, I kept talking about how I was reaching, I had this target time in my head, and I keep reaching for it. And, yep. you know, I'm just burning gas and tires at this point. And he goes, he says to me, if you can't do it in nine laps, get off the track. I was like, wow, and you know wow. what's funny? I still hold that true to this day. Even if I'm at a DE and I'm just playing around with the car, if I can't get done when I need to get done in nine laps, I'm off the track. That's it. I, it's not worth it at that point because you're just you're wasting time, oh, fuel, and energy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I thought that was funny. But those are the things you pick up, right? Every organization, every discipline of motorsport brings something different to the table. And that, this is one of those things I, I, you know, I'll never forget. So this is great. So there's like three different offerings here. Club racing, we kind of get what that is. A bunch of cars going out, class, running for points, time trials. It's you against your buddies in your class against the clock. It's qualifying. Right. It's like autocross, et cetera. Then there's HPDE. And I don't think a lot of people realize that EMRA offers high performance drivers education. And to John's point earlier, your guys' goal is to transition people into more competitive racing, either time trials or club racing. Let's talk about the DE side of EMRA for a little bit, because that's where a lot of people are going to want to get their start. I think people may be a little bit arm's length to say, I want to go racing. There's a few of us that are nuts like me and Brad that would say, all right, let's just do it from the word go. But <laughs> you know, you got to ingratiate people into the system. So let's expand upon your DE program. Let's talk about it a little bit and get people familiar with what you offer. So basically what we offer is a student program. Student program does consist of 
of classroom sessions and one-on-one -on -one instruction in CAR. And what we do is start the day with track etiquette. That'll be your first classroom session, safety etiquette, understanding that you, you know, you need to see flaggers and flag stations and what the flags are. Your first time out with the instructor, you're now seeing this firsthand on the track. You come back in, we go back into the classroom session and let's start working on your line and how you're going to drive on the track. You go back out with your instructor and they're, they're showing you that firsthand. So what we like to do is a one-on-one -on -one instructor to student in your own vehicle. And it can be anything from a stock lease through a, you know, a prepped race car. If it's your first time out, we're going to stick you in the car with an instructor to go through this program. And we do this for a while. You know, we want to make sure that the instructors say like, hey, you're okay for me not to be in the car now. You understand weight transfer and, and, and lines and, and etiquette. And you're looking at the flaggers and you know what the flags mean. And you're getting more comfortable on the track. They'll take a step back to say, okay, you know, maybe it's now time for, for your novice license. What that means is you can go out by yourself. We're going to watch you, obviously. But you can get out there in our student group without an instructor in the car. We'll eventually allow you to have a transponder in the car. And you can start looking at your times and saying, hey, you know, I'm beginning to get faster on the track. I'm beginning to understand how to drive. And that's what we try to do is, is mold you into a better driver to eventually start running real time attack or time trials. And if you want to get into racing, we can sponsor you in our race program as well. You talked about track etiquette, and that's kind of a loaded term, which I like it. It's a great term. But I think inside of that, especially at EMRA, the stress that I saw as a coach was on passing. Passing is the most important thing because of the way your guys' events are structured, especially when you move into competitive racing. So do you want to talk about that just a little bit more? You know, in our red student group, it's basically red is our novice and student group. Point to pass in designated zones only. And obviously, look out for a blue flag. You're holding up the crowd. You know, that that's etiquette as well. Yeah, what we do is in, in our driver's meeting and in the classroom sessions at, at each track, we say, hey, these are the designated zones that you're allowed to pass in. It has to be a point to pass. It's, it's when you move up into the white group, which is your intermediate, there's other passing zones on these tracks. But we want to make sure that people are following where they're supposed to be passing and point to pass when they're supposed to be pointing people past. If you're pointing somebody past, don't drag race them to the end of the, the straight. Let them pass. So these are the things that, that we need to police and we do police because it's important, obviously, safety on the track and for all of us to learn. But eventually you move into open passing and passing with no point buys as well, correct? Correct. Yeah. Once you step past that intermediate group into the blue group, that's the advanced group. Yes, that's open passing. We recommend having some sort of safety in the car. We'd like to see more than just a three-point harness. And, you know, we'd like to see a, a harness bar, you know, at the very least with some sort of Hans device because factory cars are getting really, really fast. And you're you're turning some real fast lap times, it can be dangerous. And so we want to keep it as safe as possible. We're recommending Hans device or something similar and harnesses and keeping it safe. We like to know who's in the blue group. They've been around us for at least a couple of years so that we've seen them on track. We, we know how they act. And the people in the blue group you know, all those advanced drivers, they know the other advanced drivers who are showing up to the track that day. If there's someone that, that you're passing in an area that you maybe, you know that person, you've seen him before and you say, you know what, I know this guy's lying through here and I'm not, I'm not going to try it right now. I'm going to wait until the next straightaway and I'm going to pass him over there. And I think that's part of that learning process. And it's super important to take the car home in one piece. It's mutual respect too. You know, you, you mentioned you, the, the drivers know each other. I can tell you even in, I, I race in the, in the white group and I can tell you that I know the people I'm competing with. I know who's faster than me. I know where they're going to overtake me and what corners. So it's mutual respect. You see someone coming up on you, you let them by. Again, especially in the time trial world, they're trying to lay down a fast lap. You don't want to get in their way. Same way, if I'm running a great lap, I don't want someone in my way. So when you see someone popping up behind you, you give them the point by. It's mutual respect. And you give it to them early. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, you stay on your line, you point them by, they go on the outside. I mean, if you lose a tenth on that, you're golden, you know, keep going. Exactly. I want to clarify something for those that are listening. John, the instructed group, the coached group, the DE group is red. Once correct. you transition out of red into white, now you're in a trials group. Is that correct? That is correct. Yes. The red group is both student and novice. It's the same people that are sitting in the classroom sessions 
on their first, second, third day out there are going to be the people that are racing for their first season in the same group. So we keep the novice group together. If we notice somebody is getting more comfortable, we notice somebody is is really pulling times, you know, that they're they're getting better, they're learning, we may approach them and say, hey, it's time for you to bump into the white group. It's a little more aggressive in that white group. So maybe let's get an instructor to, to jump in your car for the first session and see if you're okay with that. If you're not comfortable moving, you can stay in the red group. You know, it's all about how comfortable you are and, and how safe you're being. And again, it, it's about respect on the track as well. So this means that your guys' progression model is a little bit different than the standard DE organization, because as you move from that introductory group into intermediate, as you guys call it, a white group, now you're racing. It's you against the clock against the buddies in your class, right? As you said, you know who you're competing against, you know who's fast on track. So how does somebody then progress from there up into, let's say, blue group, the advanced group, or even become an instructor with an Emerald? What's that model look like? Because it is slightly different than the way everybody else handles it. It definitely still takes some time. We feel that the people who are coming to EMRA know that that we are a time trial group, that our focus is on competition. We like for the students to have at least two instructors ride with them. If the first instructor signs them off, then we say, okay, let's see how another instructor feels you are in the car, just to get a, you know, a different sample. You get signed off to run solo. We want to see you have, you know, no incidents, no infractions for three events, then you'll get that novice license. So after that year, we'll see how you feel, how comfortable you are, where you're at with your car. A lot of the thing that is difficult with the intermediate group is that you have guys who are fresh out of the red group, and then you have guys who are in there, or, you know, guys or girls who are in there who are ready to step up into the advanced group. It's a really big gap between the driver experience sometimes you know you could have a a car in there that's a a spec miata you know and then you have a car in there that's a z06 corvette that's hugely faster and so that's the multi-class type of thing is what you really are learning in the lower classes i'm going to jump in and also say that certain tracks drivers may be in different groups as well. When I first started running in the white group, if we went to a track that I've never been at before, I'm not going to run in the white group my first session out. I'm going to run in the red group. I'm learning the track. I'm learning the corners. I don't need to hold anybody else up in in the white group while I'm learning the track. By the same regard, I'm not going to be flying up on people in the red group because I know they're students. That makes absolute sense. Yeah. Yeah, And maybe you want to request, uh, you know, an instructor, hey, you know, can you show me the line? We like that one-on-one and we like for everybody to have an instructor. And then, you know, so after that first session, you you come back to the classroom, you talk about what happened, you, you discuss it. And were there anything that you thought that was maybe alarming or you weren't comfortable with, or were there other things that you were surprised that you acclimated so quickly to and what they, what your experience was, because, you know, you, you talk about it and you're excited about it and that's all part of the learning process. People will stay in the white group. Some people will stay in that group indefinitely. They like it there. They don't want to do anything else to their car. They really They don't feel that they need that added safety because they're not trying to go much faster than they're already going. And we're, you know, we're okay with that. That makes the group sort of gel because there are veterans there that the new guys can talk to and say, you know, what are you, are you seeing anything from me? And, And everybody's pretty open about that family type atmosphere. Everybody's open about, oh, well, this is what I'm seeing. You know, this is when I came up on you or when you came up on me and, you know, you're maybe breaking a little bit too early for this, I think you can go deeper. And so that sharing of information and that camaraderie, it, it really helped. To get back to your question, if you want to become an instructor with us, you'll need to be at least with us for a couple of years. And we need to to really know how you drive on track. We'll have instructors sit with you and then we'll have you sit as the instructor with one of our instructors and then play that back and forth. Our new classroom instructor, Bill O'Brien, he's super good. He's down from your guys' area, actually, Summit Point. He's a spec me out of driver and he's huge PowerPoint with so many different points. And we go over so many different things. It's hard to really take everything from 
from the classroom session in on one day. You know, I mean, they go over everything from the green flag to the moss line. It's like, <laughs> it's so broad. You're like, holy crap, you know, this is too much information to take in. So we recommend what, what we think, what new drivers should do in sitting in on the classroom a second time. To me, more information is always better. It's a very difficult day when, when you're on that first day, you're learning so much and you're so amped and you don't know what to expect that I feel like sitting in on that classroom session, the next time you come or the third time you come, you'll pick up even more information because you know what to expect. You're not thinking about what's going to happen with my car. When I get in my car, who's my instructor going to be? All of these different things. And you can really sort of focus on the information. And I think you get a lot more. And I think there's a couple really good points you made in that, that we need to unpack and clarify for people that are listening to this and kind of comparing it to a standard DE type of organization or even a club racing organization. When you move into that white group, you, you made a comment about how some people seem to stay there forever. The first thing that came to my mind was it makes 100% sense if you're playing the points game. If you're in a class, in a competitive class, and you know that if you do something to the car, it's going to move you out of that class, or if you move into this other group, it's going to mess up. You have your target time that you know you can achieve. It's messing with your points, especially if you're competing for a championship. So when you get into that mindset on the competitive side of the house, it it's a big game of chess. It's not about being the fastest car on track every weekend. It's about being consistent. It's about getting your points because you're going to beat out the guy at the end. He had the fastest lap this weekend, but he only showed up for one event and you did three, right? And so you've, you've nailed it at that point. So there's a lot more dynamics to this whole, let's call it game than what you would have in a standard progression model where it's like, I got to get to advanced group so I can just be left alone and drive it my fastest I can ever drive. It kind of doesn't Absolutely. really matter. It doesn't really yeah. matter, right? From what we've witnessed, a lot of groups in EMRA are actually based on how the person has prepared their vehicle. Like you said, is it a street car or is it a full on race car, you know, TTU car, or STM car, or something like that, where it's like, yeah, it's fully prepped. It doesn't belong with pedestrian vehicles. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> let's put it that way <laughs> touch on a lot of different things even the coaching is different like when i was coaching for emra in the 2018 season i actually really enjoyed it because it was the time where i got to sit down and strategize with other drivers and say this is how i can make you faster there's still the safety aspect in all of this but it's very different in a standard organization where you're just like okay we're going to be safe we're going to have fun and if you learn something that's awesome Instead at Emra, it's like, let me teach you how to take turn 10 at some point at 90 miles an hour flat out, right? In a Miata, you know, that kind of thing. And that's exciting. That's exciting for everybody because it's a yeah. different way of teaching. Develops, if you want to. Develops you as a driver. If you want to, absolutely. If you absolutely. want to. <laughs> absolutely. But I'm segueing here. I know this is a long way for me to get there, but there's always that safety aspect, right? We need to be cognizant of that. You know, the growing trend nowadays in the DE world is this idea of track insurance. And I only bring it up because I want to make sure that people understand we have had locked in on here. We had a representative come on and explain to us how it works. And so I want people to know that the minute you put the transponder on the car, you're no longer at a DE. So it's very important to understand that red group and how it works at EMRA. So if you're there learning and doing the DE stuff, you're not running against the clock, you're covered. But the minute you move out and you put timing on it, now you're racing. It's very, very different. So I just wanted to kind of throw that out there so that people understand that, but also leads to yet another question, which is if I do want to go racing, what kind of additional equipment do I need? Are transponders provided? What should I be buying? What should I be looking for? You know, things like that. No, but you're absolutely right. It's track insurance. Once it becomes a competitive event, track insurance for the competitor is much more expensive. Yeah. It's more expensive for us as well to hold a competitive event. You know, our track insurance that we have to get, you know, it's not like a non-competitive day. Like you can just kind of, oh yeah, we're just going to be out of the track or nobody's competing. Like you said, once you put that transponder on the car and you're posting times up and giving out trophies, 
it's a whole different ball game. So there's also people who run in white and blue that don't use transponders. They're out there, they're competing, quote unquote, but they're not looking at times. They're out there just to chase down people and enjoying just being in the faster groups. So that would still qualify for track insurance if there was an oops moment, let's Correct. just say, because yeah. they're not yeah. officially competing. They just happen yes. to be in a run group that has a lot of competitors in it. For those that want to transition to time trials, right, to time attack, what do they need? We all know the safety stuff. We got to buy belts and harnesses and fire extinguishers and all that fun stuff that we should have anyway, if we're really dedicated to this motorsport, whether it be club racing, DE or time trials for that matter. But what extra do you need for time trials specifically? You don't really need much. If your car passes tech, all you need is a transponder. We're going to try and get you in the right class and you're going to be competing. It, it could be that easy. Once you start to look at the rules and people will come and they'll, you'll see a car in your class, they'll just be so much faster than you. And you're like, how the heck is that possible? How can this be in my group? You start looking at the rules and, oh, well, his tires have a 200 tread wear or got a dedicated set of wheels and tires and taken some weight out or or links you know, across the car are replaced which are free <laughs> <laughs> The rules were updated last year. We thought we needed a refresh. We worked with a, a guy, Mario, and we were able to keep the rule book short so that it's not huge volume that no one's ever going to read. But Emra sort of created the improved touring type of classification, which is very minimal, if any, power modifiers, talking about just a, a simple intake and exhaust. You got to keep all the mechanicals in the engine factory stock and the brakes factory stock and can't move the battery around and different things like that. We had a little bit of modifications to that, like allowing fender flares or rolling of the fenders and different lightning mods and stuff like that. You know, suspension is free as long as you use the stock mounting locations. But as technology progressed, you were able to get like wicked awesome stuff in those stock locations that completely change, you know, the dynamic of the car where you were just putting a, a Coney or a Bilstein up in there. Now you're putting a three-way adjustable remote reservoir in the same thing. And you're like, well, I bolted it to where the Bilstein bolted. So, you know, that's fair, right? <laughs> We've changed a lot and we got the car classifications list and it's ever growing. You know, there's always a new cars coming out and you have to have like 10 different classes just for Corvettes, let's say, because even this year you have the C7, the Stingray, the Z06 and the C8. What the hell? They're all in different classes. You know, they all have different abilities and different speeds. It's a difficult game. We have a good points system for it. And we're confident that this year it has worked pretty well and the cars are becoming, you know, more fair. I think that based on some times, we may start to require safety because we've seen a couple of bad incidents, not just within our own group, but within other groups with the community. There was a couple of bad crashes with NASA as well this year. Thankfully, everybody's okay, but it, it really begs the question, you know, how much safety, how fast are you going and how much safety do you really need in the car? The cars are getting so fast now. So fast. Yeah, I, I always say like, hey, a, a stock, you know, Civic Type R from the factory, change your brake fluid, you're out on track and you're going fast in that car. Yeah, I mean, your mom's Camry makes 300 horsepower these days. So I right. mean, just put that in perspective. So going back to something you mentioned several times, Corey, you don't need much to do time trials, but you do need a transponder. What our guests and our audience can't see is I'm holding my, my laps in my hand. Nice. A lot of people are probably thinking, oh man, this must be some big old box. I got a mount in the trunk with antennas. So I look like a cop car or it's something from IMSA <laughs> or, you know, something like that. And in reality, this thing's about the size of an old flip phone and you mount it pretty much anywhere in the car. It's, you know, remote charge, 
remote signal, all that kind of stuff. And you put this somewhere in the vehicle and it reports to the tower at the track and basically gives you guys position and time of every lap of where each car is. And so the investment in one of these, you know, depending on what you want to do, if you want to buy one, especially one of the old school ones, you know, go on eBay the, the prices are really high for a hardwired one. Yeah. The new my laps, you know, they're pretty much, I'd hate to say the only game in town for this sort of thing, but it's what everybody uses for both motorcycles and cars. It's a subscription based service. They almost throw this thing at your head, but you got to pay the license fee for every year. And they do some promotions and whatnot. Let's call it, I think the last time I renewed, it was like a hundred bucks for a year or something like that. But yeah. don't quote, don't quote me on it, right? So it, it fluctuates from time to time. So you're in it for an extra, let's say a hundred bucks, 200 at worst to go racing, not doing anything else to your car. Like you're saying outside of maybe some safety stuff, maybe you want to have a fire extinguisher with you, better tires, you know, brakes, stuff that you'd be spending money on at a DE anyway. Correct. So to be official, you need one of these little boxes, right? And that to your point is all you really need to go competitive time trialing at the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah. What's I nice mean, also is with registration, we also rent transponders as well if you don't own one. So we have a bunch of those that we pay the subscription on every year. And when you get to the track, we assign you a transponder with a mount, a couple zip ties right onto tow hook, your front bumper, wherever you want to drop that and you can start time in your car. That's right. Now, I will say in-car is really up to you. These days, there's a lot of really cool options. And we talked about them on our drive through episode a couple of times. You've got the new Garmin that just came out. You've yeah. got the traditional, the AIM solos. You've got guys yeah. using their phones, using Harry's and Track Addict and things like that. So for in-car feedback, guys, just understand that the MyLapse is not designed to give give you immediate feedback. It is designed to talk to the tower at the racetrack and give officials your time and position on track. So if you're looking for something in car, there's a lot of different options. And I can't suggest one versus the other because they all provide a different feedback and different training, especially the new Garmin was developed to give immediate feedback and give training and things like that versus some of the older like legacy tools that are out there. So lots of other stuff, you know, once you don't have an instructor in the right seat with you anymore to try to help you become a faster driver and a better time trialer. At the Absolutely. Time. To be clear, we couldn't accept times from your in solo. Device. Your, yeah. Exactly. Dude, exactly. We need an official. You know, we need an official time scorer, and that's what the transponder is. So that's for us. And you can watch it live. I mean, we have a few different streaming, you know, race hero and different things where you'll be able to see your times as they come come through you know once you pull back into the pits it'll have your session it's instant which is also hilarious when you have friends and family at home especially <laughs> your wife texting you going well that session sucked for you didn't it <laughs> yeah, yeah. the race hero is yes. awesome for that you know that that positive feedback yeah. but <laughs> hopefully your wife's at the track having a picnic though while you're out sometimes yes but otherwise she's on she's on race hero watching from home but still it's, it's kind of cool to have that ability right for so your friends Absolutely. Tune in, see what you're doing. It wasn't that long ago where it was with stopwatches and exactly. and writing stuff down. And we had a bunch of volunteers, Marty Barnett and Callie and Ginny and Caroline, and they, they would have their stopwatches and you'd be waiting, standing, waiting for them to come out with the sheet to see where you were. And it's so crazy how much it's changed in, in such a short amount of time. Technology has been a good thing for time trials. That's for sure. I can't say oh, that yeah, for yeah. a lot of other things, but in this case, <laughs> it has really, really helped. But I think Absolutely. there's one one final question Brad has about kind of the structure of Emra and how you run your weekend and, and how things work. And I think it's a little bit more in line with coaching before we transition to our next segment. So Brad. First of all, with the coaching. So you mentioned before that you want to coach with Emra. You need to be with Emra for a while. So is that to say that you don't accept certifications from reputable uh, other groups like SCCA or NASA or PCA or BMW or even Motorsports Safety Foundation? Do you take those credentials and, and give them any way when you're trying to decide if you're going to allow somebody to coach with you? Yeah. Is there any reciprocity there? I think is what Brad's getting at. <laughs> yeah, we absolutely accept that and we welcome it. The instructors that we get from, especially from the Safety Council, that's, you know, 
know, that's like first and foremost, it, it's just, it's amazing. And those guys are, they, you know, they're great. We offer obviously discounts and different things for instructors who come along. Typically instructors that come from other places, we'd like to know you a little bit before we would allow you into any of our run groups because of that, of that whole safety thing and who are you running with and what are you used to? Because we don't know how you drive, but, you know, instructors can go out in any session. If we know who you are, you know, hey, you're here, you're doing work for us, and you go out and have fun whenever you have the time available to you during the day to go and do that. We absolutely accept all credentials and, and all licensing. You know, even if you have a time trial license with NASA or even a HPD 1 or 2 or 3 with NASA, you know, we'll try to put you in the group that we'll, we feel that you're most comfortable with. And if we say, hey, listen, we, we don't really know you, you don't really have a lot going on, but, you know, we can see, you know, another thing for technology is we can see where you registered and, and who you ran with and when the last time that you ran an event was. So it's like, well, okay, so we'll, we'll put you in the red group for now. And come and talk to registration or one of the group leaders, because each run group has a, has a group leader that anybody in the group can go to during the day with any questions or concerns. And if you think maybe you're a little too advanced for this group, or maybe the group is too advanced for you, listen, I'd like to step down or I'd like to step up. What do you think about that? And this happened just at New Jersey. We had a, a gentleman come to run with us and we didn't know his credentials and we had him in the red group and one of our other drivers knew him, said, oh, I, you know, I know this guy, we've run together and we have different events and stuff. And I think that he's ready for the white group. So we moved him up and after that first session, it was like, okay, the corner workers didn't tell us, you know, hey, that car number, whatever, was doing some crazy stuff. We asked him if he felt comfortable, and, and he was. And so that was, that was where he stayed. So most of the basic points are there with all the instructors. We would accept them signing off on people as well. But then again, we would have one of our regular instructors also go to sit in the car with someone before we would let them go solo and just to make sure that they're on par with our sort of way of doing things. So I want to pull a couple of threads there for instructors and coaches that may be listening to this episode. It's something you hit on and something I, I know I've experienced working with Emra in the past everybody pays to play. <laughs> so that's really important because coaches have come accustomed to a certain way of being, I will put it that way. I don't mind it because to your point, John, earlier, it's a nonprofit organization. The bill's got to get paid. So I don't mind throwing in and saying, hey, it's going to cost X for the weekend, even if it's at a discount. But the upside of that is coaches get to go anywhere they want and they get to compete as well. Right. So that is correct. Yeah. So you're racing as well. So that's kind of an added bonus is you're giving back, you're teaching, you're prepping other, you know, potential racers and whatnot. You still got to pay to play because you are a competitor as well. So that's really important, but let's talk about expectations of a coach during the day. What's the student to coach ratio, you know, things like that. Are there anything else special to EMRA that coaches should be aware of coming to the organization for the first time we expect the coaches to be interactive with the student most of the day on track off track as well answer any questions that they might have go ahead john yeah i was gonna say share the experience again you're learning something in the classroom you're looking at a at a powerpoint deck when you get out onto the track you're experiencing it to be able to share that experience and and to coach through that experience is what we're looking for yeah and we want the coaches to make the students feel as though they're important to them during the day because in the past it's you know there's been instructors who are like oh i gotta i gotta go you know my session's coming up well listen this isn't your only session you can go and run in any session you want take the time and and help to groom them because we want them to be happy and we we want them to enjoy the experience 
and to get something out of it. If they want to continue, we want them to continue with us. And and you never know, that guy that you're teaching might become your rival, might end up in your class, right? And who Absolutely. knows, might actually beat you, get that hot lap that one day, you know? <laughs> yeah, so, it. and it's, so it's a one-to-one -one ratio. You, you mentioned the ratio before. We have a an instructor one-to-one -one with a student. That instructor is assigned to the student all day. Very yeah, cool. we'll go through the registrations and we'll sort of see what the vehicle is that they're bringing and what their ex prior experience was, if any, and then we'll assign them and the instructor will have an interaction with them even before the event, just to kind of say hello, familiarize themselves and, you know, tell them what to look for when they get there. Like I had said before, it's a, it's a lot in one morning, you're like nervous and you got all this tension and I'm going here. I got to register. I got to get my car teched. I got to meet my instructor. Then I got to go to the classroom. And it's like, it's just, you know, information yeah. overload. And so we want to try and make that experience as easy as possible. So one last thing about this experience, are there student evals and are there instructor evals, you know, vice versa, where people are grading each other? And if so, how does that work? Absolutely. John, you want to touch on that? You know the system better than I, but okay. yeah, um, yeah, go yeah. for it. <laughs> yeah. It's an automated system where the emails will be sent to both the instructor and the, the student for the day, as well as there is a sign-off sheet for the student that the instructor and the student both will fill out together before they hand it in at the end of the day. Emails go out. They're basically surveys. They go out after the event, but the sheet gets filled out the day of the event. It's anonymous. It's only anonymous because we don't share that information with the instructor or the student. It's really for us. And maybe if there are concerns and things, we'll discuss it with the instructor and the student the next time that they show up because we don't want people to hold back if something happened that you didn't like by the same token you want people to also say what they enjoyed you know it, you want to have that positive feeling that positive vibe that hey you know this was great i had so much freaking fun instructor was great and i'm coming back a couple of our instructors are super awesome and we always get great evals from them. You know, they have great feedback and, you know, what can you say? You just say, hey, instructor of the weekend, you know. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I think we've done a really good job of covering, to your point, the vibe, the feel, the, the way Emra is and the, how you guys operate. So I think it's time we transition a little bit. And, you know, we've got guys now listening to this going, you know what, I, I want to give Emra a go. So now we need to get down to the nitty gritty. And so I'm going to turn to Brad for some follow on questions. Yeah. So I'm new to Emra. I, I've never run with you guys before. I mean, I have, I'm just pretending. <laughs> He's role playing now. Yeah. yeah. Where do I find an Emra event? How do I register? Where do I register? Yeah. So you can find us on any of the social media channels uh, at Emra Racing on Instagram, slash Emra Racing on Facebook, emraracing.org on the World Wide Web. <laughs> but if you go to emraracing.org slash events we will show the events for the season included in your your registration now is photography so you'll see all the past events on the site as well but yeah you can find us you know that way do you register through emra's website or do you use something like msr or club registration yeah, so we're we're using uh, msr motorsports reg for those that aren't yeah. familiar right <laughs> yeah and the link the link for all the events you know on the web page it will link directly to ms reg most of us have a an ms reg account at this point and if you just type in emra all the events that are available to register for will show up Okay. And then, so what's the average cost for a weekend at an EMRA event? So it depends on the track. Obviously, we mentioned right. before, prices are going up. There are more expensive tracks and less expensive tracks. What we try to do is estimate the potential turnout based on previous years, divide that by what it costs us. And that's what it's going to cost for the day or the weekend. Typical events going to cost you between 275 to 325 for the day. Try to reduce that if you come for the weekend. So anywhere between, let's call it 650, 700 for the weekend. Certain tracks are cheaper than that, so we're able to bring the cost down. On top of that, again, if you want to uh, rent a transponder, I believe it's forty dollars for the day, sixty for the weekend. You mentioned that you know you're concentrated in the tri-state area. You know, I guess up there near near Lime Rock and, and you know the, those type of tracks up there. What would you consider your home track or your home base? 
Yeah, where you have the most events per year, I guess. Bridgehampton. No, no. Um, <laughs> no, I miss so Bridgehampton. I think at this point, it would have to be either Lime Rock or New Jersey Motorsports. I think at this point, our premier event of the season has become New Jersey Motorsports. And we do something unique there, which is lightning one day, thunderbolt the next day. So we're able to split that up. We now do go-karting on Saturday night, try to uh, break things up, get everybody in a, in a spec cart, you know? Everybody out there together. Don't walk over to the go karts with a beer in your hand, though. Whatever you do, no <laughs> oh beer in your God. hand. Oh my God! Everybody comes walking over with a beer, and they're like, "You can't go! You can't go! You can't go!" We're like, "What?" <laughs> Yeah, so that weekend is it really is a, a great event. You know, I, I wish I had it on video, but man, it is funny watching everybody go from like lightning over to thunderbolt with like half put together trailers, cars <laughs> hanging off, and like this train of cars and trailers coming through is is awesome. I would call that our premier event, but I do think that probably Lime Rock is our home track because we're doing two events there a year, and we're gonna also incorporate the auto cross and the skid pad the morning will be the autocross and the skid pad and then we'll go on track from one to six a very quick day you'll have five 20 minute sessions in that time and we'll run them quick they're gonna run like like clockwork it's a lot of fun and it adds a a bit of variety to the events say lime rock's a little rushed uh, with five 20 minute sessions typically get a little more track time it's it's closer to two hours of track time in the uh the full day events good to know I've looked at your schedule. I've picked NJMP because I like Thunderbolt. So I'm picking that Sunday. I'll probably come out Saturday for go-karting. What do I need to do now? Do I just show up and I can drive? Do I mean, do you guys do tech? Not everybody does tech, but if you're a racing organization, I'm assuming that you guys do. And what's involved with tech? What do the drivers need to know? So every okay. car gets tech that goes out on track. I can speak for at least the personal safety, long sleeve shirt, closed toe shoes, long pants. Corey, you did tech, man. You should take over on, the, on this one. It's a pretty rigorous test because the car is going to be out there doing things it's not normally doing, you know, every day. If you have a race car or a, a dedicated track car that we issue a logbook and we'll do a season tech on that, which is once a year. And then... You just kind of come over with your helmet and your logbook and you say, hey, I'm here. I'm checking in and get you a sticker and and you'll be good to go. But for the other cars, you know, when you show up, you'll go to registration and you'll be contacted prior to showing up by the registrar. If there's any questions from him or also just to give you the information packet to familiarize yourself with what the schedule of the day is going to be. And where, you know, where to go, there'll be a map of the track and the paddock and everything. And it'll point out where registration and tech is going to be. You'll go through that. You can line your car up at tech inspection. There's usually three or four guys there who are looking over the cars. So you have to empty your car out. Nothing in it. We even require you to take out the floor mats, which some people have a problem with because floor mats today, they're they're molded in and they got hooks. And if something happened, God forbid, a hook broke or something and that mat bunched up onto your brake pedal, you could didn't get the pedal pressure that you needed when you needed it, something bad might happen. So everything comes out. If you're going to do some sort of in-car video or things like that, you're going to need a tether on that camera. I know cameras are getting smaller and smaller, and probably if it's going to hit you in the head with your helmet on, you're not even going to feel it at this point. But we still do require a tether because we don't want you to get hurt in that regard. So then we'll check the battery. You want to look for any sort of open wires. We need the the positive side covered, that it's securely mounted. And this is just for DE sort of stuff. Then we'll check, you know, that the wheels are tight. We'll look for any play or listen for any sort of loose fittings or bushings in the suspension as much as you can, you know, just in a static state. Look for anything else that's loose or maybe seems like it's not installed correctly. And then all the glass. We need both the front windows down and if if there's a glass sunroof in the car, you'll need to have some tape on that. And that's really just to kind of 
keep the glass together in case something happens to get hit with something or if it breaks. Since it's tempered, there's a plastic film in between the sort of glass layers anyway, so it's really going to stay there, but we'd rather have it keep in one shattered piece instead of all over the track. Then they got to come clean it up, and then 20 minutes goes by, and questions <laughs> go, and, you know, you drop an oil, and, you know, we look for leaks and oil and, and things like that. And then also we need your uh, class designation and a number. I mean, that's for the corner workers so that they can point you out when you're naughty. <laughs> but you don't you don't require someone to have their vehicle checked by like a mechanic or something before coming. We offer a, a sheet for you to have that completed. We are still going to go over the car. Of course. We won't go over it quite as rigorously because, okay, we're going to trust that this mechanic, you know, had looked at it, but we're still going to check the battery. We're still going to make sure everything's out. And also don't forget your helmet or any other safety items because we have to check for dates and all of that. And tracks are starting to require their own sort of safety items as far as helmets go. Open face helmets are no longer allowed at New Jersey Motorsports Park. Recommend that everybody get a full face helmet. Even last year, there was uh, some delay with the 2020 helmets. And so there was a ton of confusion about who Who's accepting what helmets? You know, because you have to replace it every 10 years. They recommend that you replace it more often than that, but that's the requirement. So the SA2010 was not supposed to be good for this year. But because of delays in production and raw materials, they were saying, oh, we're going to allow it now. So the tracks were flip-flopping and other groups were flip-flopping. So it, it was a really tricky year for that. After this year, the 2015 is going to be your oldest rated helmet that you'll be able to use. You know, you touched on something going through that tech explanation about numbers and classing. We all have our favorite numbers and that's fine. But classing, you did talk about it. You kind of alluded to it earlier. So let's just touch for a moment on how classing works at EMRA. So we've rewritten our rule book, as Corey mentioned, for this season. So what we do now is we start a base class by power to weight ratio. So if you're running in a time trial group and your car comes out of the factory and it's 100 horsepower and weighs 1,000 pounds, you're set in a base class. On top of that, you have exception points. I always like to use that Honda Civic Type R. You know, that Honda Civic Type R sitting next to another Honda Civic Type R that has 40 treadwear tires on it is going to be a couple seconds faster. It's hard to put those two cars in the same class. So that's where exception points come in. So what we do is we have your base class with exception points. Now, Corey mentioned before, you know, suspension is free as long as it bolts to the same, you know, mounting points and sway bars are free. Certain things like power upgrades and big arrow will allow exception points, which may bump you into, let's say, another class up. And again, you take that Honda Civic Type R with those 40 treadwear tires, you put big arrow on there and, and a tune. That's a much faster car and it shouldn't be in the same class as that factory stock Type R. So that's how we class is a base class with power to weight ratio with exception points on top. So guys, we covered a lot about what is EMRA, where you come from, how to get there, what to do, the track day, all this kind of stuff. I think we've got people really revved up to come out and try an event here. And so what I wanted to ask is, is there anything we didn't cover? Are there any other services that folks should be aware of that EMRA offers? One of them I, I know about, and I'm kind of wondering if it still exists, is the annual endurance race. Is that still something that EMRA puts on? And what other things like that would folks maybe not know about for turning in for the first time? I'm going to jump in and say we haven't talked about award ceremonies. Um, oh, okay. A- after every event, not the weekend, literally every day, we do have an award ceremony. We do present awards to the race and, and the class winners of the day. At the end of the season, we do an awards dinner. We've been teaming up with FRCCA for that. And again, we're presenting the championship from that season, basically the point winners in, in each class and race for the season. But I'll let Corey take over for the rest. We do not run the endurance races anymore. It was taking up a lot of time that we no longer have had available to us on the track days, unfortunately. We ran 50 years of the four-hour night race, which was honestly my favorite race 
of the year. It was like the last hurrah of the season, you know. You would take whatever you had left and just put it out there on the track and, and see how far you could make it. I really enjoyed the event, and if we have the interest, I would most certainly look at running the endurance races again. If we had the interest, we, we would definitely consider doing that again. I, I would like to approach some point with doing that again, but you know, like I said, we, we need the interest and, you know, with AER and the different clubs that have sort of focused on that type of racing, we're moving sort of away from that, whereas those groups are focusing on that kind of racing. Absolutely. You guys are hyper-focused on time trials and, you know, the times are changing and, you know, you're giving time trials its day in the sun, which is great. And focusing on that global time attack and all that, I think it's the right direction. And sometimes you just got to let things go. I mean, I mean, to do things for tradition, just to keep doing it. And to your point with interest waning, but now you've got all this new interest in something exciting like time trials and you're building on that. And I think you've got yeah. aw an awesome foundation to continue that going. And, you know, that foundation wouldn't be there without the help of sponsors and, and other organizations and people coming to the table. So is there anybody that you'd like to give a shout out to while you have the opportunity and you still have the audience listening? So I'll turn to John in marketing for that one. Sure, sure. So first you mentioned Global Time Attack. We'd like to thank Jason. We do speak with him a lot and we cross promote events with him. So definitely like to thank Global Time Attack. A couple of our sponsors, we have Metro Auto Body, Race Align out in Deer Park, Exineering Motorsports, List Technologies, Island Motorsports, Otis Ford, Fast Forward, uh, On Track Photography. Those are our main sponsors. k and Brakes, they certainly help out. Dry Shine, uh, Wireless Car Care. There's a bunch of them. And I think something that we touched on before, we have a, a photographer taking pictures of everything all day. And this is part of what you're getting now as well. And you can go to the website and download any of the pictures of any of the cars or any of the paddock action, the trophy ceremonies, everything, you know, and, and I think that's great because it helps you to sort of remember the day and show off a little bit to your friends too. Like, dude, check this out where I was this weekend, you know? And if I remember correctly, Zipkin is part of that car club and beer drinking society we talked about at the top of the conversation. <laughs> That is correct. He is actually Certainly. our representative. <laughs> <laughs> Different nice. beer at every meeting, right? Love it. I just want to add to what Corey was saying. We actually have on the site now a uh, photo request form as well. Any event that you you know you want photos from, fill that form out, and we'll go ahead and send you all the photos that we have of your view. Yeah, I mean we're taking drone footage, and <clears throat> and I mean there's all sorts of video and and everything, and it's all available. Well, folks. If you'd never heard of Emron before, I don't know how, because they have been doing <laughs> grassroots motorsports racing since 1969. Can you believe that? Celebrating over 50 years of endurance, club racing, time trials, and DE. So if you haven't checked out EMRA yet, you should. EMRAracing.org for more details. The Eastern Motorsports Racing Association, EMRAracing.org. Follow them on Facebook and on Instagram at EMRA Racing, and use the online contact us form on the website to get a hold of John and Corey directly if you want more information or more details that were not expressed in this particular episode. So with that, guys, I cannot thank you enough for coming on here and sharing the Emra story, telling people what it's all about, getting people excited again about time trials, you know, another flavor, another discipline of motorsport that maybe somebody's just hearing about for the first time. I didn't know I could do that. Didn't know I could compete against the clock against somebody else in my class. You know, all these kinds of fun things that we've come accustomed to in the time trials world. So I thank you both for coming on and, and, and sharing your story. Can't thank you enough for having us on and allowing us to share, you know, the story. Uh, amazing to be here and we appreciate the opportunity that's right listeners if you enjoyed this episode be sure to check out our patreon for a follow on pit stop mini sode so check that out on www.patreon.com forward slash gt motorsports and get access to all sorts of behind the scenes content from this episode and more if you like what you've heard and want to learn more about GTM, be sure to check us out on www.gtmotorsports.org. You can also find us on Instagram at Grand Touring Motorsports. Also, if you want to get involved or have suggestions for future shows, you can call or text us at 202-630-1770. 
or send us an email at crewchief at gtmotorsports.org. We'd love to hear from you. Hey, everybody. Crew Chief Eric here. We really hope you enjoyed this episode of Break Fix, and we wanted to remind you that GTM remains a no annual fees organization, and our goal is to continue to bring you quality episodes like this one at no charge. As a loyal listener, please consider subscribing to our Patreon for bonus and behind-the-scenes content, extra goodies, and GTM swag. For as little as $2.50 a month, you can keep our developers, writers, editors, casters, and other volunteers fed on their strict diet of Fig Newtons, Gummy Bears, and Monster. Consider signing up for Patreon today at www.patreon.com forward slash GT Motorsports. And remember, without fans, supporters, and members like you, none of this would be possible. Thank you.